and it says we're live, so I will believe it and say hello to everyone out there who's uh, watching our webcast. Um, this is another episode of Stigler for the Details. My name is Alan Dickerson, known by some in the war gaming and, and uh, computer gaming world as Stigler. And today we've got a Euro friendly version of my show where we've adjusted the time so that it's uh, eight in the morning where I am. And for my guest, uh, one John Edwards from Scotland, it is 4 p.m. It is so we're got... going to have a chat today. Hello, how's it going, John? All good, thanks. Huh? Good, good. So what we're going to do today is uh, have a bit of an in-depth chat about uh, getting getting under the hood, so to speak, with uh, Vassal and how to streamline and speed up production of modules. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know, uh, John has been making a name for himself uh, in the War Game Enthusiast pages on Facebook by creating these really great tools that just speed up the production of Vassal modules. I mean, it, it's it's incredible, as you will see. So we thought it would be kind of nice to uh, showcase what John is doing and uh, let those of you who are interested in Vassal module creation uh, know where they can get some of these tools so that they can put them to work in increasing the number of uh, Vassal modules available for all kinds of games. Um, John has been focusing mostly on uh, SBI games, but I imagine uh, this can be transported to games uh, for any other publisher with some modifications to the uh, specific sizes and patterns of their counter sheets. But uh, this looks like uh, technology that is completely portable uh, across the wargaming publishing world. So with that as an intro, I'm going to kind of let John um, tell us about them. But, but before we do that, I just wanted to kind of uh, ask John where when and where did you get started with Vassal and also in Wargaming? Kind of give us your your history lesson as far as your involvement in Wargaming and then Vassal. Well, as far as Wargaming, it, it really goes back to, to the middle 70s. My my cousin was um, was a keen miniatures Wargamer. Um, he ultimately became um, a colonel in the British Army Signals. Um, and I always found miniatures. I had my I had my miniatures, um, particularly ancients. Um, did a lot of model making, but actually the core of wargaming to me was was the strategy. And I discovered cardboard probably um, having played Risk and having played lots of games. Um, I discovered cardboard and SPI in the in the middle seventies, probably around about nineteen seventy seven when I was thirteen. And funnily enough, next to me. Is my um, is my folio copy of SPI World War One, which I still have. I have the map. I pieced the counters back together again. But I really got back to back to war gaming. I was a very keen follower of SPI way back when. I got back into war gaming um, a few years ago, and would love to have been able to play some monsters. I know Alan's a, a lover of Highway to the Reich, which I, I was too. Um, I'm a lover of Atlantic Wall, and of course, these huge games are in, are impossible to play without an enormous house and you know, and no children and no people to intrude on them. Um, so I discovered Vassal. You know, probably you know, I, I genuinely don't know. I have to go back and have a look. Maybe maybe two or three years ago, and started to hunt around how to use it. I found it a little variable as mo different modules by different people behave differently, and that's kind of how I've got to where I am today. Um, I got very keen and I found Russ Giffords, I know Russ was on last week, I found Russ Giffords SPI archive site um, and as you may know there are modules for SPI games available out there on SneakerNet um, if you know the right people to ask um, and I discovered that you know not all the games were available 
you know, and that there was some variability in, in just what was set up. Um, so as I was doing and starting to build out my own modules, I, I kind of realized there was a gap to to really have a vassal that was that was focused on hex and counter games. Um, as Alan said, um, I've built it to, you know, a publisher and a scale with some examples from that. But really any kind of half inch counter, it can be sized to five eighth inch counters, um, any size hexes. What I've tried to do is build a, a quick start template for, for hex and counters games um, with all the things that you'd usually have, you know, to run effects charts and combat results tables, you know, a splash screen, some help and some sides. But all things that are, you know, take a long time to get to know how to do effectively in Vassal, I think, um, I think Alan. So that's where the concept, and really, I've got a couple of things that that are, that, that we discussed running through today to, to let people see based on what I published in the Facebook site. First, maybe just a quick walk through what the Vassal template is, and firstly, using that template perhaps just as a basis for you to go directly into the editor and build that out yourself for for whatever game you want to you want to extend it to, um, and hopefully finding there's a bunch of patterns and capabilities that are in there that, that, that really fast track how you build out your module. And then I'm gonna kind of go with a super speed run version, which is where you can actually, through a zip tool, you can actually drop some predefined assets into the module and it'll start to build out some of the components quickly and easily. Now, one of the key parts that's, that's time consuming with Vassal, as everyone knows, is building out the counters. And I'll show you that I've actually built some Vassal pieces, which are which are not scanned images. So that those of you who haven't looked at Vassal pieces, pieces are a set of traits and attributes that, that define what, what appears on a piece. Um, and the Vassal pieces I've got there as a quick start if you want to build those out. But I'll also show you a little tool I've built, which does a slice and dice of, in this case, an SPI 200 counter sheet. It could be any kind of counter sheet, and it chops that up into into vassal counters so the process of cutting editing pasting name and and not so much the naming we'll come back to that but certainly the process of getting your pieces scanned and chopped up and getting them into your module i hope i can show you a quick route to that as well so if i give you a quick start to how to create a whole module with with visual assets you know maps and and um guides and whatever combine that with the counters i hope that's a very quick way and a standardized way to build out the modules. So that's really where we are. Uh, well, uh, sounds great. So shall I dive into the module, um, the, the template, um, Alan? Is that, is, yeah. that is that where we'll go? So you're not seeing much yeah. at the moment. It's, it's yeah. pretty much like, like any Vassal module that you open up in edit mode. Um, you'll see this template's a little thin. What it's got, it's got some pieces and, and it's got a couple of toolbar setups. It actually has on a toolbar, it's got a predefined template for charts. Now those are empty. It's got a space for a terrain effects chart, a combat results table, a sequence of play, whatever. Um, it's got it's got a pieces window that's a, that's a little bit clever in that it can it can appear and disappear, um, and it's floating. So I, there's quite a lot of modules out there where your piece window is is fixed in place. You can get rid of it, but you can't kind of move it around, drag it and drop it onto the map. So so what I've done is I've got a floating piece window. I've clearly got a die roller. I really like the symbolic dice, so you get it reports the the disc results, uh, the the die results, and displays them in the image. Um, it gets some nice vassal repetition there, um, so it's got those. And you'll see it's also got a couple that are grayed out. If I actually start the module, if I say if I run my free setup, um, you'll see the module has two sides defined. And I finish that, and actually you'll see there's there's kind of oh uh, for some reason I've actually got a, I've got some vestiges of a map in there. Um, it's got a map, it's got, and now it's opened up, it's also got a turn track, um, which has got some content in it. Um, and it's got a little, my little graveyard symbol is actually my dead pile for my eliminated units. Um, and you'll see also I've got a turn counter, which is not very sophisticated. It's just a simple turn counter. So those are all kind of out of the box. You'll see it also has out of the box an overview map button. Um, so that it will generate the overview. So there's a few pieces that are there predefined. What I'm going to do actually is I'm going to take this. I'm going to take this um, rather cruddy map at the moment. It's got a, it's got an image behind it, and I'm going to drag on one of my pieces, and I'm going to drag on a couple of my others. And what I'm going to show you is, 
Also built into the template are some predefined piece actions, counter actions. So if I right click, you'll see you've got the ability, it might be a little small, to rotate to show the zone of control. Um, so display the zone of control data for, for that counter, assuming a single, a single six hex zone of control. It's got movement trails. And if I bring back my dead pile, if I also if that unit's eliminated and I say go to the dead pile, it sends it there and I can drag it back again. So just a few bits and pieces that if you're building a module out every time you do it, you know there's a bit of work involved in doing this. Um, yeah. It also incorporates you know things like a step loss. Um, so and it reports the step loss up here. You'll see all my movement has been reported. We'll come back later. Of course, the, gra the the map's a bit ugly. It's not lined up, and that's going to be a consequence of any graphics you drop in. There's going to be a little bit of work. Um, oh, I've, yeah. also, I've also put in here an untried status, so we've actually got an untried um, unit as well. So oh, you know, um, so and it's got things like you've got the ability to clone your units or your markers. You know, we've got a couple of predefined markers. I've got a victory point marker. And what I've done is that can that can that can set that to a specific value. So you go, oh, I've just achieved 20 VPs, or I can say um, decrease that, you know, or increase that. So that's just a simple VP marker. And of course, for my turn track, you know, I've got a game turn marker as well. So that's so all. So you the have your yeah. So you have your victory point counter set to um, to show like any number of victory points rather than having one for the tens and one for the zeros yep. on a sliding track. Absolutely. Mm, so this just is a, a very quick idea. and easy way. And of course you can create multiple VPs. You'll see one of my other modules, you know, I've got individual VPs in different colors for, for different, for, for different, um, for different countries, different sides. So you'll see this has got yeah. side one, side two. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to dive to the editor to let you guys see, you know, a little bit of the internals of this. Um, so you, what, what we've got is, is to, in order to handle the VP, and um, as we're talking about that, the VP uses a, a dynamic property. Dynamic properties are great. If you don't know them, you want to, you want to go and look at them and understand them. So it's got a text label that is actually just the words VP. It's got a second text label that rather confusingly uses the variable VP. And then the variable VP is defined by a dynamic property. And I've got a, in this case, I've got minus a hundred plus a hundred. I've got control equals to increase it, control minus control control minus to decrease it, and a set capability. So you'll see that's my that's my control equal, my increase, my decrease, and my set. So that's a that's a good example of how those unit that that particular marker is, is there. Clearly, you can use the game term marker, the VP marker, to go off and when you create your own module, you know, build out some more. So rather than scans, you know, these are predefined vassal pieces that are doing that that are that are doing that work for us. Um, as I mentioned. You know, we've got in the in the map definition. Um, you'll see my map board, and it, it's automatically picking up a map, and it's picking up a map called map.jpg. Um, and what I've done is I've defined a hex grid, and I've defined some grid numbering on that, so that if I drag in a new map, as I'm going to do shortly, you know, I can go to the hex grid, I can edit the grid, and then it's really just the case of my getting that aligned. And you'll see it's pretty close, and then um, good job, the numbers are close too. So you'll see. And I've been pretty lucky here. You know, the columns and the numbers actually match up nicely to to the underlying uh, map that I've got here. Um, clearly, this is somewhere where you want to go and learn and understand. There's always going to be a little bit of fiddling to to get this map aligned to the grid, and we'll come back to that when we drop. Sometimes a lot of fiddling. Yeah. The, well, as as I saw a note that you put on Facebook, Alan. You know, if you get it absolutely straight and aligned. You know, then and you've you've already got this defined to um, to five eighths um, hexes or half inch counters. It works pretty dang well. So the, it I, we've all spent a lot of time lining up maps and getting that right. We can do another session later about actually if I'm doing a great big map um, that's maybe a three or four mapper, I'll yeah. probably in Photoshop put a put a grid in a, a hex grid in there and then align the map to the grid rather than the other way around. So that I know my grid's consistent, so that when I drop it into Vassal, it's really clean. So that's a couple of the pieces here. We've got some prototypes. We can we can come back to that. Um, there are some examples in here if you want to drill into it, um, anybody online, you know, a little later on, you know, how we can actually use pieces of prototypes, for example, to have an infantry black symbol or um, the definition of the stats. In this case. 
I've got a unit that's a 346, and the 346 unit has a step loss, which takes it to 126, and has an untried value of, zero, of U6. And you'll see we've got the ability either to step loss that or reset that back if it receives some kind of replacements or reinforcements. So again, this isn't in the case of these items, this is not using scans and flips. So the values you're seeing here, that's taking that back to, to reset that back to the 8812 unit. Um, that that's based on um, the um, that's based on a dynamic property in the in the unit, and you know go and poke around in this if you're interested. You'll see that there's a number of other things we've got. So in my unit definition, I've also got the size, the ID, the parent, and the stats for the unit that are all defined, and that defines the the fonts, the the position on the counter, and if you look at the prototype counter, that's where I've set up all of those lovely things that you saw earlier the reporting of the step loss, the send to location to send it to the dead pile, the zone of control, the movement trails, and the rotation. So as I said, these are things that if you're setting up a module from scratch, take a bit of setting up. I'm sure those of us who do modules have got our own ways of doing this. But what I wanted to do was rather than, as you can't really take that stuff from module to module, you often find you have to pick up a previous module, edit it, take some bits out. I thought getting to some kind of template was a was a good step forward. So. So that's the so that's some of the template items. And you'll see if we go back again, if we look at charts, you'll see in my panel, I've got a I've got a, a file called chart CRT that defines the that defines what the, the chart file is. And currently that's blank. And back in my map, the other thing to note, we had a quick look that the map board was called um, was called map.jpg. But in the overview window, I've also got a button, and that button is called icon map. So what it's going to do is if I change the entries in the vassal to a new set of files, you'll find that the vassal is going to update with those with those images. So that's kind of the that's kind of the slightly slightly risky, slightly dangerous. Um, if we go into the zip file, it's possible to go and take this and and fill the vassal with those components um, without going into the vassal editor. So clearly here, I could if I wanted to, I could go to my map. I could go to my map board and go and pick up um, a map of my choice, you know, maybe one that I've been working on recently. Um, so I've been working on a I've been working on a Veracruz module. Um, so I can pick up my my map from there and open that and say okay to that. And once I close and reopen, there is always a bit of messing around. But that's now if yes. I go to my if I go to my map and um, if I go to my hex grid in this case. And edit my grid. Oh, it hasn't updated it. I'm going to have to close and reopen. So yeah, and that's exactly. the problem. Uh, another yeah. another caveat that uh, I I definitely want to state is that you know as as you're using uh, automated tools like this, you're doing a bit of multitasking between Vassal and uh, Game Scans and Photoshop and Illustrator and Inkscape yeah. or whatever it is that you're using. Always be sure if you are editing a Vassal module through 7-Zip or WinZip or some other archival program, do not open a Vassal module that is also open in the editor when you're doing any of that archival stuff because you can corrupt the entire module and make it completely unavailable if you do that. So if I if I go back to my template, what I'll do is I'll open this outside of editor mode, um, and we should hopefully. Um, this is always never do a live demo, as you know. Um, so yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna do my my free setup. You know, never do a demo when you don't know what's gonna happen. But if I if I say a file and um, oh I didn't I didn't save the changes. Sorry. Um, so right. I didn't save the map change because what I wanted to do was was actually. So that's the template. So a few key features of the template. Let's just let's just check on that. So. The what makes up the template are some predefined actions, obviously, like the counter rotation and the movement trails and those things. But actually, there's a few assets that are defined that you can overwrite. So in this case, you'll see. So I've got my chart for combat results, sequence of play, terrain effects, unit identification of victory points. I've got I've got those all defined as JPEG files with a defined name, chart CRT, and so on. Um, I've then got an icon for the map and an icon for the pieces. And then I've got a map for the turn track and a map for the JPEG. 
I've then got a few other icons which you saw for the the, the charts, the dead pile, you know, the hide. Oh, by the way, you, I hope you like my I hope you like my no see a monkey for hiding. Um, that's my that's my monkey for um for hiding units on the map. So the icon for pieces and the icon for the map are the are the red blob and and the grey blob that are doing pretty much nothing here at the moment in the module. Um, so these are the things you can change. Um, one other little clever thing, and maybe if we get time, you can remind me, Alan, is I use a one by one transparent one pixel overlay for a lot of things. It means you can have a, sim a definition of a piece that's got a that's got a layer that's got nothing in it, but you actually have a value in it for that one by one, and then you can replace that value later rather than having a layer that doesn't have anything in it. You create a layer. So I use it a lot on piece definitions in Vassal. Um, that when you're creating, rather than having a number of different layouts, that one one that has an image and one that doesn't, or one that has you know text and one that doesn't, I have a, I have one common layout, and I use sometimes I use the one by one um, transparent one pixel, very tiny file um, that's always there even when it's not in use. If you see what I mean, it's a it's a it's a neat little trick. <laughs> That I'll show you in a moment for for doing symbols, perhaps that you are that that aren't that aren't common in Vassal. So you can l overlay your own little symbol icons very easily over Vassal um, using using a very small um, um, PNG file. So I use the one dot the one by one as a placeholder. So shall we go and see if we can we can break our um, our Vassal mod, um, Alan? So what I might do is. For anybody who was on the Facebook group, I actually did create um, a file for the destruction of Army Group Center. Sadly, Charles had gone off and done some great work as well um, and created a parallel destruction of Army Group Center. But what I've got over here is I've got a set of assets that I predefined for this game. And in this case, you'll see the files called chart.crt, chart.sop, the file called map, and the file called map-turntrack. Map what I've done is I've created all of these assets ready to go, um, and you know I've got a one called help help dot cover help dash cover rather, and and these names are all the names that I just showed you in the spreadsheet. So what I can do if I open up my desktop where my um, where my um, Vassal template was living. So this is my hex encounters template. What I'm going to do just to make sure we don't get confused is I'm going to call that. DAGC. Um, and what I'm going to do with this is I'm actually going to open this. I, I prefer 7-zip over, over WinRAR or whatever, but if I open the archive, you'll see what we've got now is, is the contents of the vassal, vassal file in WinZip. So you'll see there's my help guide, there's my build file, module data, and there's my images folder. So it's the images we really care about. So this is where my images sit. I've got a few extraneous ones that I've created for those um, um, for those files we saw earlier. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go 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 back to my DACG. I'm going to take these files. So I'm going to take all my charts and, and uh, sorry, I'm going to take all of my charts. I'm going to take my um, my cover, my icons, my and my map. And what I'm going to do is back in set back is is take all of those and drop them into my image folder. And seven zip, it's on my other screen over here. It gives me a little dialog saying, "Yep, is that what you want?" So we say yes. And if I exit that, what I should be able to do is run up my back on desktop. If I if I run up my vassal, what I'm going to do just to make sure I don't get a don't get a wrinkle is I'm going to clear my tile cache, and then what I'm going to do is is run that destruction of Army Group Center. Now I'm just going to run it straight in vassal, and what we should get if it all goes to plan, it's it's processing the tiles, it's coming up, and we hope here we go, um, we now get. That's the image you just saw, the DACG um, image. Um, it's gone too large on my screen, rather annoyingly. Um, so um, if I select my setup, I'm going to say free setup. Um, I haven't changed my sides yet, so it's just going to be my sides. And there you go. So there's my map. There's my um, there's my piece changed. Um, of course, we still haven't got any pieces in. Um, and there's my overview map. 
And if we click on my charts, there's my terrain effects chart, my CRT, my sequence of play. This is the same file as you saw a moment ago. This was this is not cheating. This has created this this vassal file based on that. And clearly, if I go into edit mode, so I'll just exit that. If I go back to vassal, you know, that's a bit confusing because it's called template. So what I'm going to do is go back to my desktop. I'm going to edit this module. And I can change template to just so it doesn't get so confusing. We would change that to DAGC. Um, and it's version one. And you know, that's my I mentioned the map alignment. Funnily enough, if I go and look at my map and go to my hex grid, again I can edit my grid. You'll see these the, the original image wasn't so great, but if I scroll across, you'll see it's a little bit out of alignment here. So I've just got to maybe bring that in in size and bring it up a little. What I normally do is I go to the absolute opposite corner of the map and see how it's doing. You'll see exactly it exactly right. You see, it's not it, no, it's not great. So we'll make it a little smaller, and there we go. We'll make that a little bigger, and then if we go to the top again, you know, we'll see it's a little off. So it's. It's a bit of compromise here because the, because the map scan clearly wasn't great, but I think that's probably uh, that's almost a near enough is good enough um, for now. So there's a bit of messing around to do that, but if I save that um, and say okay, and then I and then I run my setup, you'll see it's not bad. Clearly, I haven't switched off the grid, by the way, guys. You know, the, the grid's still sitting on top of the map right. with the numbers because I've got to go and sort out the grid and the numbers. But you'll see also there's my turn track. Um, on my, I'll, I'll do a little bit of dock. Um, my turn track, I have actually got a numeric grid here that, I go, that I'll go and overlay on the, on the game turn grid down here and then take that off. So, but, you know, hopefully, no pieces yet, but you think that's a pretty rapid way of, of getting that going. So back in the back in the editor, you know, clearly what I would do now is I go to go to my sides, I'd get rid of side one and side two. And you know, I'd I'd create my I'd create my Germans German and Soviet. Soviet. Now little wrinkle, uh, what I'd say you do also that I'd really recommend if you go to the prototypes, what I've done here is I've got counter side one. So counter side one, I'm going to go and change that to German. So the Soviet should probably be side one, but that's life. Um, and change that to my Germans. So this will be important when we start to look at counter. So that's my counter German. And then my counter side two, you know, I'm going to change that to, oops. So yeah. And side two. So all that's done is is this is something we're going, to, we're going to use when we when we go and assign our pieces and we load our load our scans in, we're going to use this prototype German and Soviet to sort them out, and we've got a prototype also called Marker, you know. So so that's basically I I tend not to use sides very often in terms of actually locking down pieces and limiting them, um, but it is useful yeah. to have that side identifier so you can you can do you can do some of that. So. What we've done there is we've gone from you know a blank template to a template that's got you know a couple of sides in it. It's been named. It's got a map. Um, so clearly, the next thing to do is to consider you know how you might go about counters. So um, I don't see any. Um, I, yeah, I, I had a power off as well, John. John Longshore saying his VCR is blinking for some reason, but um, um, or, or is blinking twelve? Is it blinking twelve um, on the back of the fact that we're looking at a nineteen seventy three SPI game as um, in modern tech? Um, um, so Made time stands still. We did. So, so the next step in in advancing time is to is to consider how how are we going to get the counters in easily? And for the, any of us who've done Vassal, you know, getting you know a couple of hundred counters or even two thousand counters created as pieces and getting them into the module. You know, takes a, deal, takes a deal of work. Um, I've, I've got a couple of steps through. Maybe what I'll do is I'll show you a really a really simple example of of how we did that for for the um, um, Army Group Center, and then I'll talk about rear rear counters as well. So the way that I've sliced up the counters really uses 
it uses a tool and Alan, I think we've got them kicking around in the background. Um, it's we, we I create a file to a specific size and shape, and then I use a, a product called Image Magic to slice up that that image file. Now it is dependent on the image file matching to a template. Um, and the nice thing about you know SPI is they stayed pretty much the same through you know through twenty years or so of, or fifteen years or so. Um, as far as the, the look and feel of their counter layouts, as the GDW and pretty much as the as the GMT. So I've set this up for for SPI so that I can I can slice up the the image file um, the way that I want it. So in this case, what I'm going to do is is I'm, I I've got, I've got the image file that I use in Photoshop. You don't have to use Photoshop. I will flip across to to GIMP to show you how you can do it in a free tool as well. But I'm lucky enough to have Photoshop. So actually, Photoshop isn't doing anything clever here. All Photoshop is doing is is it's actually managing the um, it's managing the slicing up of the picture. So you'll see here I've got an eleven by seven um, page, which has a grid overlaid on it, and it's one inch from the top. You know, it's a quarter from the sides, and it's got a quarter inch in between for half inch counters. That is the standardized SPI layout. And what I'm going to do is, is I'll show you how I can actually edit um, a, cup, a, a front and a back and turn those into 200, actually 400 um, individual scans very quickly and easily using a little routine. So nothing magic about Photoshop here. All I'm doing in Photoshop is actually lining it up. So what I'm going to do is, um, and I think I'll go, I've been working on um, a, a, a vassal for Veracruz. Um, so what I'm going to do is go and pick up, um, I don't know where my, um, I'm, I'm, I'll, they'll have to be slightly different in color, actually. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my front and my back. I've got two dodgy scans here, which I'll come back later. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my, my front first off, and I'm going to drop it into this. And you'll see it's automatically dropped in. And you'll see the scan clearly doesn't have quite the right size. But, but what I need to do is, is align this scan with the, the cut lines that I've got. So what I'm doing is I'm, is I'm getting those in line, move those across, get the die cut lines in place. And if I overlay those with the die cut lines, what's going to happen is whenever I cut my file up, it's actually going to it's going to cut along those lines. Now I'm not sure this is completely straight, um, so I'm just going to do a quick check of that. See if it, this is how this is how you straighten in Photoshop. I'm going to try and straighten that layer. Now it's um, it's just a, possibly a little bit off on the um, on the um, on the on the scan. So this is this is scanned from my copy. No, that's better. Um, so you'll see we compromise a little. We're a little bit out here and there. We can come back to that later um, because I'm going to do what Alan hates and bevel my counters because that also takes away the look of the. Um, of ah. the it takes away the look of the die cuts, which is a very good reason for doing it in my in my view. Um, so you'll see here, I've got my grid. What I'm going to do in Photoshop is actually I'm going to switch off the grid. So now we know this is 11 by 7 and it's bang on a specific place. If we actually look and I change that to pixels. You'll see that that is going to be, you know, exact exactly a set number of pixels. You know, that's going to be 150 pixels down. It's going to be 75 pixels in. You know, at 15 at 1575, it's got it's got a gap in the middle. So, what I'm going to do is save this, and I'm going to save it to my desktop, and I'm going to save it to a PNG file. I I, I work in. I work in these in 300 pixels per inch um, and then ultimately take them down to 75. The nice thing about this, of course, is if you want to work in higher resolutions, you can do that. But the template's designed around about uh, around about um, 150 pixels per inch, so a 75, a 75 pixel counter. So if I save that to counters front and if I go back again and get my rather ugly um, rear and drop that in, um, it's still saving, so that's why it's just um, it's just, uh, I'll just tell that to save, um, and then I'll go back and drop my drop my rear in into the file. You'll see it's um, taking a little while to work because it's doing a save at the same time. So, um, but there's there's my back of my counter. So get my grid on again, 
and then say, right, how close is that? It's actually pretty close. We'll say okay to that. Um, just juggle it around so that the die cut lines match up. So I don't know if you can see. Um, die cut lines in the back aren't nearly so bad, of course, um, because they're not typically not cut all the way through. Um, another one is you like to see on the back um, the boxes match up almost exactly with the crop marks that the SPI used. So funnily enough, in this case, this was a really good alignment on the back from when they stuck the, the original sheet to the cardboard um, and then printed it through. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to file, I'm going to save as again, and I'm going to save that. Now, the name is important. My, my routine does use um, counters front and counters rear. So I'm going to save that to counters rear. And what that's going to do is that's going to create my two files. Oh, in fact, I messed up. So that, that one's going to have a grid on it. Um, let's not bother with that. We'll carry on and do the cut later, and you'll, you may see the tiny grid on it. So I mentioned image magic. So I've now got two 11 by 7 sheets, one for the front, one for the back. One thing to note is actually, you know, when you clearly when you flip a counter sheet over, um, counter one doesn't map to counter one um, in position. So you'll see counter one there actually maps to counter number 20. Um, on the, on, in fact, in this case, it's, ah, uh, that's an interesting one. That's going to mess up. So in this case, it's an upside down sheet. So what I should have done was actually image rotate that 180 degrees. Yeah. And then I'll just put my grid back on. And then you'll see, interestingly, counters front, you know, count, oh, sorry, I, re I rotated the whole image. That was very dumb of me. So let's yeah. put the image back. Undo. And what I'm going to do is, is rotate just the, is, is just rotate the layer the layer yes so i need to i need to rotate the back um 180 and now you'll see it's a little bit my grid's a little bit out now so because it's not always quite the same when you flip it around so i'm going to do that uh, um just to save a little bit of time i'm gonna i'm gonna do a file save as and i'm gonna save that to um to counters rear again So save that to the rear. Um, and just to highlight, so if we look at the front, you know, counter number one, this 4-8, um, actually maps to, on the rear, counter number 20, which is upside down. And my script actually, I'll, I'll show you later, it does actually flip those up the right way as well as part of my routine. But um, you'll see that one goes to 20, you know, two goes to 19, three goes to 18, and so on. And now, I'll sort that out a little bit later. Now, when you uh, work with your script, do you have yep. to go into it individually if, if you have a, a counter sheet that flips and make some edits to it? Um, that um, would be different than if you had a straight up counter sheet that just yeah, flips yeah, yes, horizontally? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. Yeah, it would. So you'll see I've got one little comment that, that, that just all, all I flip is the, is the final counters. Um, it, it assumes that you know you get you get them aligned with row one to row one when you start, um, right. and all, all we're all we're checking on is that um, it aligns at the end. So so yeah. So image magic I mentioned. Now it, this might be a bit scary to some, um, but I'm using image magic. Now it's I'm sure it's possible to do this in Photoshop, but goodness knows if I know how, and maybe even possible in GIMP. But image magic is a really powerful tool for image manipulation, but it's a command line program. So what I've done is I've got a little Windows program that actually does the, does the work. And you'll see it cuts 200 sheets, um, the counter's front. It's a 300 pixel image, 11 by 7. And the first thing it does is it takes off the borders. Then it removes the column in the middle. And then it removes the separation rows. Then what it does is it goes and crops them into 20 by 10 and numbers them. So we'll see that in a moment. And then. It's going to process the rear sheet with doing pretty much the same thing again. And then I've got an optional here, a rotate of the rear. Yeah. So actually what I, what I need to do is put my rotate back in again, because what it's going to do is get my is get my rear counters the right way up. So, you know, sorry, guys, bit techy. Um, but, you know, and the other thing it does, which you can also make optional, Alan, is, is does a little bevel on it with a raise five. Um, right. So this final piece is the naming where it switches 20 to 1, it switches 19 to 2, it switches 18 to 3, and so on. 
So let's just let's just do some magic. So um, if I go back to my desktop, I've got my counters front, I've got my counters rear, and if I run it up, what it's doing is it's doing that convert routine. So it's it's going in, it's chopping that up, it's taking the borders off, and it's going through the the separation of those pieces. So you know I've done this, I did this at a in a kind of speed run on. Um, I can't remember. I can't um, on um, a mighty fortress earlier on today, and I yeah. was able to create the two hundred counters in in the space of about ten minutes. I had my counters done. So uh, this, just while this process is, it's doing the rear. It's almost there. Um, it will create a folder called counters, and it will also, if I go to extra large icons, it'll create it'll create this file here, counters grid that it's working on. And you may see it flash by. The grid actually has all of the all of the pieces separated it. So there it is. You can see the grid is is not the same as as the original. It has no gaps, and now grid's gone away. And when grid's gone away, that means that this file here, counters, has been created. And in the folder counters, it's a little bit ugly. Oh, and so it's it's just doing the renaming um and it's doing the be doing the beveling for us um some interesting color variations but yeah the that's because the front, there. Front, front and the rear weren't great so um it still hasn't done my rear rename either which we're just waiting on and um, there we go so now we've got so there's the unit and it's the fronts have got a prefix of f we'll come back to that in a moment so there's what there's all my units you'll see it's created them all what i tend to do um is to make life easier um is actually i'll create just to make life easier on the import i'm going to create a new folder um, and i'm going to call that mex and what i'm going to do is take my mexican units and drop them in and we're going to have to pretend these guys are germans and russians germans and russians in a moment but that's um that's kind of manageable um, and I'm going to create a folder again. Now you could do this individually, um, but you know I'm going to I'm going to do a new folder just to just to keep these a little neater. And I'm going to click in between. There we go, new folder. Um, so I'm going to stick my US units in here. Stick a few more of those Mexican boys in there, and. Um, I'm going to drop them in. Um, there, I've got a few markers. I'm not going to bother with the markers just now. Oh, no, let's be. Let's be a completist. Let's um, do the markers as well. Um, any demands from the audience? Um, so I'm going to do a new folder called markers. It's the process. Um, yeah, yeah, I get it right. Yeah. And I'll drop them in. So I've now got those three folders, markers, Mexican, and US. I've got I've got two two piece two scans per per counter. So I've just done four encounters in whatever that was, you know, seven or eight minutes. Um while talking to, to you guys about it. So if I go back here and I go back to um I'm gonna add the Mexicans and the US into Army Group Center just to just to confuse things. Um it's just an alternate oh, history. Oh yeah, that's right, you know. Um, so right now, what I'm going to do over here is is actually I'm going to go to my pieces, um, and you know I've got I've got a window for side one and side two. What I'm actually going to do is just get rid of them. I'm going to create a new panel. I'm going to call this US. Uh, uh, people have got different styles. I like fixed cell size, kind of ten column, um, for my for my panels, I don't really like the, the 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 setup where you have to click each individual counter to see it. Um, it depends very much how often you visit the counter windows, whether they're on the map. But I much prefer the style of having a grid of counters that you drag across um, than having um, the one by one clicks for different unit types. I find it really difficult to find the units that I'm looking for. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually, I'm going to show you first off, how am I going to get those pieces in? Well, I'm going to go to markers. I'm going to say multiple pieces. Where I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to my um, my desktop, if I can find it. I'm going to go to the folder called counters. I'm going to go to the folder called markers. Say, OK. These are the pieces that I created there. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and say, right, these are all markers. Yeah. 
So the prototype name is marker, and that's going to bring the characteristics of a marker um, to them. And then the, then the, now comes the science. I'm going to add a layer, and the layer is called flip. And what I'm going to do for the layer is flip and control F. And what it's going to do is say, if the name ends in F for front, then this is going to be the flip layer. And if I save that, in a moment, all of these Fs are going to disappear. So we've now got, for each piece, and I can't remember why piece 120, I copied it in the wrong area. And um, we've now got a layer called flip, which has the front on the flip layer. Clever, right? Eh? So if I say OK to that, it'll load 33 pieces. And there's my 33 markers. We're going to go to my Yanks. Um, and I think my Yanks are going to have to be Russians. Um, no, the, the Yanks, can, yeah, the rank, Yanks can be Russians. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go back to my US folder. And I'm going to edit the piece template. And in this case, the prototype is, if you remember earlier, we changed it. It was called Counter Soviet. And, and save that. And then OK. There are 77 Yanks. And I'm going to take my Mexicans. I'm going to add them with multiple pieces, which means going up. This is where it's easy to put them in a separate folder. Yeah, so you can see the you can see the benefit of that. Edit the piece template. You know the the it, this is clearly a throwback to the Zimmerman telegram because um because the the Mexicans are going to be Germans in this case, which takes us all the way back to World War One. Um and say okay to that, and that's ninety pieces. So there we go. We've now got my Mexican units, my U.S. units, and my markers. And if we go to one of my units, you know you'll see if I flip it, there's my untried side. And there's my my unit. Some other time we can come back and look at draw decks and, and untried and, and masking and all that kind of stuff. But really, the intention of that was that's how quickly you can get to a lot of units loaded into the map and loaded into a module. So that's a module, you know, in kind of 20 mins. There's stuff still to do, but actually, you know, on my army group center, you know, it probably took me another 20 minutes after doing this stuff um, to to update it. So that's fantastic. Quick rollback, um, I mentioned Photoshop. Um, you can do this in GIMP, as I said. So this is a slightly different counter set. And in this case, this is a, this is a couple from the, the Crimean War quad. Um, and in this case, here's my counter from two different folios. And GIMP is free. It's not easy. But if you're interested in just lining up the stuff for the templates, you could use GIMP for this. Um, you'll see here I've actually got four scans side by side, the front and the back of Alma and Balaclava. If I get rid of the front, you'll see there's my back counters and there's my front counters. Um, and probably not enough time today. I've actually, in this case, the grid that we had previously is nice and nice and narrow. And you'll see over in my counters, what we did was we actually, we beveled them so that the so that wherever there are actually die cut lines they're not very visible um so the beveling for me works for that but if you want to be really clever and like alan you hate beveling what you could also do if i switch off my grid line what i've done in this case is is i've actually got a mask that as if by magic um is going to is going to block out those horrible die cut lines so what i've done is i've created an overlay using this grid that we line up to the die cut lines and then when we switch that on you'll see that all the die cut lines disappear and we've now got really clean counters that don't have any die cut lines on them and the way how I've, many pixels thick does that line have to be for the mask um i think it's about seven or eight it, it's as big as you want to make it to be honest yeah um it you know you'll see down here there's a few of them that are still showing a die cut line and if I move it around, you know, you can you, you've again got to do a little bit of juggling between cutting text and getting it. Probably the important thing here is, though, that if I take that off, what I've done is I've created a background that's just like, you know, the SPI counter sheet with just the color before the printers. Yeah. So this is this is I said to Alan previously is kind of the way the printers would handle the bleed areas. You know, so you can see when I switch them on, you'll see the gaps between the different nations um, are are designed so that the colors don't bleed, except for that the, these couple of points in the middle. So what I've done is I've created a special background that whenever I switch on the mask, you see the background, and that cuts out the die cutting. 
So, you know, from this, if you want, if, if, if anybody's entertained, I can do a save a copy of this. Um, and, oh, it's gone, it's gone horrible onto, onto the wrong size. So I'm going to, I'm not going to bother with that. So GIMP, I don't know terribly well, but I just wanted to show that you can do all this clever stuff in terms of just lining the image up and making the image prettier in GIMP without spending a lot of money on Photoshop. So, so that's GIMP, that's Photoshop. Okay. One other thing is clearly what that's done in Vassal with my with my module is it's brought in all of these um all of these pieces which is nice but you know the pieces are don't have much don't have much of a meaningful name you'll see that's reporting as 102 and 102 moves from from here to here so clearly you've got two choices you by the way you can of course always go into the module editor and drop your images into my template but here if you want to go and fix these piece names you could go one by one and just go and say right that's piece number one you know, and change those names one by one for your for your 200 counters. So, you know, that's clearly what you normally have to do when you create a module anyway. So, you know, it's not that awful. But you know, I'm a bit of a fan of of doing things doing things um, automatically. So, what I've actually done is back in the in the in the Excel routine is I've actually got a setup that you can use, but it does involve a bit of effort for each game. Um, where I keep track of, in this case, you know, where the counter is, you know, what country it is, what size it is, what it is. You don't need all of these things. You really only need a name. Um, and that what this is going to do is it's going to rename counter number one to be German Infantry 6, German Infantry 7, German Infantry 12, and so on. So to actually let you see the results of that, if I go back to the ACG, which I was in earlier, um, What I've done is I've is I've saved that renaming routine, and you know clearly this that this might be for those of you who who aren't, aren't so keen on tech, you know it's it's maybe not what you want to do, but if I go back to my Army Group Center module, my cutting and renaming of of those items um, which are just coming up, um, so this is. This is my pieces, and in this case, if we go back to the piece window for my Germans, you'll see all of those names come through from the pieces. So, so my naming convention is country, size, you know, type, and then uh, and then the re unit reference. If you just wanted the unit reference, clearly you could do that too. Um, so what I've done is I've is I've gone through for the two hundred counters, um, and I've created a naming routine that does that. Now, the reason I've done so much on this is actually there is another, probably another broadcast sometime out there, um, which is giving us the ability to create these counters in another free product called Inkscape. So I could actually use the, the descriptions that I've created here to go and create, if I prefer red Soviets to olive ones, I could create um, a red Soviet counter with, with yellow text and it's going to be a two five with an untried value of five. So I can actually go and create um, digital images of these counters that I could then reuse in Vassal again. Um, or I could use this to go and print out a set of counters to my own, to my own manufacturer. So that's the reason that, that I've wow. done this little bit of extra effort uh, for this particular game. Clearly, if you want to just rename the 100, 200 counters that relate to the game, it's pretty easy just to, bash that through in the vassal module once you've brought them in so that was a quick well, that, that's the thing about vassals that it's uh it's all about possibilities and Absolutely. you know some of the possibilities just involve a lot of time and these these things you're showing us are are just ways that you can trim a lot of that that time i can't yeah, well, tell you well, how much and trim how some much of the time i've uh, spent and trim some of the possibilities as well. <laughs> yes yes because I don't know about you, but when you first start going on Vassal, the possibilities can be very confusing. And and when you start saying, well, how did that guy do movement trails? Or how did that guy do, um, you know, an untried unit? How did you do a draw deck? You know, some of those things. Um, right. So clearly, I, I've learned I've learned a deal about Vassal creation. But what I'm trying to do here is is make it simpler so that people can get into their own Vassal creation more quickly with some primitives that are already there. Or equally, I think if people are using 
any of my modules have a degree of consistency between them so that the behaviors are the same, you know, the, the two bars and the, the, are, are predictable. Because I think that's one of the challenges of the Vassal, because everyone does things, you know, in many different ways. Right, right. All right. Well, uh, let's see. We only, let's see, there, there are just uh, five people who are tuning <laughs> in live, and uh, no one has... Uh, has posted a question. I, I think uh, everyone is, you know, just a little bit uh, flummoxed because, you know, there, there just is a lot of detail here there is. and uh, a lot to get used to. Uh, but what I thought would probably serve everybody um, the best would be for you to uh, let our viewers know where they can find uh, each of these these uh, programs or spreadsheets or automated uh, scripts or so, give them a, a contact for you so they can get them from you directly. Sure. So there's a, there's a bunch of them on, on, on Facebook in the, in the Vassal group with, so the latest templates there. Um, for those of you who haven't come across simpubs.com, simpubs is, is, is a site that I've created, which is a digital archive of SPI games. Um, Simpubs is is in is does need you to, to register a user because you know copyright holders don't want these things publicly available. So you know it is it is a managed user. You just go and log in and you get access to the site. In this case, it does have um, it does have the um, the primitives for SPI games. So for example, here's Agent Core. It has counters. It has maps. But more importantly. In our context, is we've got our Vassal template here, and the latest version of the template, the help guide and the README, um, is here. Um, it's got it's basically got the Excel sheet that explains the assets. It's got a PowerPoint guide um, to the Hex Encounters template, um, which which gives you a little bit of guidance to how it works, um, and it's got the guide and the README. It's also got um, so you'll find if you PowerPoint, you can open up um, again. So this is the Hex Encounters Guide. It talks about the pieces, the maps, and, and what remains. It talks about the piece setup. And it talks about how you might use an overlay. And then it talks through um, how you how you create maps, what the dead piles are. And so there's a PowerPoint there that, that steps through this that's available on Simpubs. Um, uh, that's also published on um, the, um, the Vassal, Vassal Wargamers Americas. Um, Facebook page. You can get me on Facebook. Um, you can get me on Twitter, at JZ Edwards. Um, I'll stick some of this up on, on YouTube as well. I haven't got a lot on YouTube. Um, but yeah, uh, but equally, if you're interested in classic SPI games and you, and you haven't been, you know, right now, SimPubs is, is very much a test environment. It's running on a home server. I will move it to a cloud server. It's taken me a bit of a while to, to build it out and get the content that we're looking for. Um, I think it's I think um, it's got a rather nice um, gallery view, as you'll see, um, where you can actually see all the contents of the of the SPI games. You know, so um, so, for example, these are some of the image assets that relate to, for example, the Alamo. It takes a little while to load that one up because um, it's running as say running on a home server. Um, but, you know, have a walk around, have a walk around the site, you know, have a look at um, what we have and, you know, and you can get the the Vassal template files from there from a from a folder called vassal template that's great i'll drop the um i'll drop the counter cutting stuff in there as well i have got a i have got a little powerpoint in progress on the counter cuts um say so don't be too scared by the counter cuts um you will be able to if you can line up a counter sheet on a page then all you have to do is run it and it'll go and generate all those counters for you um so i'll do a little walk through a little more slowly on that as well great great well um that has been a information packed hour <laughs> and uh yes I, I i think the uh the web address here for uh sim pubs is is really going to help um yeah help everyone uh find this stuff so that they can kind of digest it uh, more at their own pace but uh, i know i'm looking forward to going in there and uh grabbing a hold of some of these uh, automated tools uh, for counter creation because I, I just remember spending hours and hours and hours doing scans uh, one at a time in Photoshop and, you know, 
Yep. Grabbing a piece that's 100 by 100 and making a copy and sticking it in another file and then saving it and giving it a name and then going back and doing the reverse side, you know, just to keep it straight so that I would have all, all of my names straight. And then having to reorganize it again once I got into the Vassal module itself. So this uh, this could save a lot and, of time. And if you take the time up front to just do a quick spreadsheet of the naming, um, then it, or if you're working with a designer who gives you access to those. So if you're actually working on games and you've got access to the original design assets, of course, you would hope the designer's got an inventory of pieces and an inventory of, of counters. So you could even shortcut it by getting access to that so that you could do a very quick rename to get those counters, you know, very quickly, you know, onto onto the right sort of names and sorted and 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 itemized into into what you want in Vassal. Yeah, indeed. Um uh I'm I'm surprised that more uh designers don't use Vassal for playtesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's kind of hit and miss, but, uh, I, I know that, um, for the play tests I've been involved in, it, it really made the play testing go a lot quicker because usually your teams are made up of people who are spread across the country and they just can't get together, uh, whenever they want to play the game. So they can play um, them over a vassal. With, with a template, you can accelerate that. I think one of the challenges the designer is, you know, getting some physical assets together is a challenge, getting them out to share with people. I think that's where a template's a great principle that, that, that could fast track the designer, perhaps get them, you know, I come from a kind of accounting and manufacturing background. If you get the design guys in the, in the production guys involved early in the design, then it would accelerate the release of the vassal down the line as well. So, you know, there's a lot of good reasons why you get that multifunctional team, multidisciplinary in, in building that stuff out. Exactly. All right, John. Well, I've uh, held you here long enough. Uh, I'd like to let you get back to your, your afternoon of uh, rest and repose. And uh, it's, a holiday here. it's a holiday here in Scotland too. So, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I've done my I've done my walkout in lockdown, but of course it's been a productive lockdown weekend this weekend. So quite a lot done. Great, great. I got out in the yard as well, so I'm still feeling it actually. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. we will see you over on the uh, the Facebook Wargaming pages, and we look forward to seeing more of your work. I I see we've got a uh, mighty fortress and Vera Cruz to look forward to. So I'm sure our uh, SPI Vassal Module Archivist uh, will be very happy to have some uh, new wares to place on, well, on strangely his. Enough, uh, it was GDW Europa that started all this. So I've done I've done one big GDW Europa module for the France, but you know the, the the Grail one is actually is actually to do Fire in the East on this stuff. But you know we'll get to wow. that. Yeah. There's all already right. a Fire in the East module out there, but it'd be nice to have it followed through to Scorched Earth too. Wow. Yep, those are some big projects. We will leave you to it. Thank you, John. It was great having you here. And uh, everyone, we will see you next time on a Stigler for the Details. I am Alan Dickerson, and this has been John Edwards, and we will see you next time. Thanks, guys.